Hello and welcome to this presentation on the digestive system. This is for ALHS 1011, the structure and function of the human body. And in this presentation, we're going to be covering a section of the digestive system called the alimentary canal. Basically, the alimentary canal is the pathway or tubing that allows food to move through the digestive system. So it enters in the mouth and goes through the pharynx and the esophagus, through the stomach, into the small intestine, works all its way through until it gets to the large intestine and comes up, across, down, and out. So the alimentary canal is basically the tubing and by the end of this presentation you're going to know the majority of the anatomy listed on this diagram. You're going to be required to learn all of it for this section but the way we're going to cover this is we're breaking it into the alimentary canal, again that's the pipeline, versus the accessory organs which are things like the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas, the spleen over here, and these are organs that help supply enzymes and different chemicals that are going to help us digest and prepare to absorb food. So again, this section is covering just the anatomy of the alimentary canal. Starting with the mouth, this is where food enters the digestive system and where we masticate, which is another word for chewing. There's also enzymes delivered by the salivary glands. One of the main ones is called amylase, which helps to break down carbohydrates. But the salivary glands are going to be part of the accessory anatomy we're going to look at at the next section. So once food passes through the mouth, it turns into something that we call a bolus, B-O-L-U-S. And this is basically how food gets chewed up or masticated and moved to the back of the tongue where it's prepared to then enter the second part of the alimentary canal, which we refer to as the pharynx. The pharynx, if you look at the, the picture here on the bottom, is broken into three sections. And this is basic med term. Here's the nasopharynx, naso referring to the area behind the nose. And then below that is the oropharynx, returning to the area of the mouth or the oral cavity. And then just below that is the area called the laryngeopharynx. And this is just above the, an area called the larynx. Now the larynx is where our voice box is, and this is going to the front passageway, um, which will contain air that goes to the lungs. So air is going to, go, going to also go through the mouth or nose and into the pharynx and then it's going to divert anteriorly and go down from the larynx into the trachea until it makes its way to the lungs. But since we're in the digestive system, we're going to look at the path that food follows from the mouth then to the esophagus. So the area between these two things is called the pharynx. And as you'll see on this diagram, there is no division between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. This is how air can go in both your nose and your mouth. However, in the case of food, of course, we're going to start with the mouth, and then it's going to skip the nasopharynx and actually just go from mouth to oropharynx. And then as you swallow, the bolus of food will go from the oropharynx to the laryngeopharynx and then enter the esophagus. And you may be surprised to look at this picture on the right and see how long the esophagus is. And it does go from the area of the pharynx all the way through the thoracic cavity where it crosses the diaphragm and then enters the stomach. So here's an anterior view. You can see the esophagus coming through the thoracic cavity. This is the diaphragm. So it goes through a hole in the diaphragm, which we call the hiatus, and then is going to enter the stomach. Also, you'll see that the esophagus runs posterior to the trachea and lungs. So the pharynx splits, the anterior side is uh, for respiratory, so it's where air travels. Posterior side is for food. So again, food will enter the oro or the mouth to the oropharynx, laryngeopharynx, and then go into the esophagus, where it'll travel all the way to the stomach. Now the way that I'd like for you to look at the stomach is I'm going to section it into uh, some regions. If you look up and look superiorly, then we're talking where the esophagus comes in right here. Cardioesophageal area is where the esophagus connects with the stomach. And there is actually, you can't see it on this diagram, but there is actually a sphincter, which is a round muscle that closes to keep things inside. So we do have a cardioesophageal sphincter. Then if you look to your right, there's a dome part of the stomach, which we call the fundus. Throughout this area, 
is what we call the body of the stomach. And then as it gets thin down here before it gets to this part of the small intestine, we call this the pylorus or the pyloric area of the stomach. So the major four major parts of the stomach are the cardio portion, the fundus, the body, and the pylorus. There are two sphincters associated with the stomach, the cardioesophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter. So basically, when the cardioesophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter are closed, it's going to keep the contents of, of what you've just swallowed inside your stomach. And this is going to offer an opportunity for all that hydrochloric acid and other enzymes that are going to break down food to surround and coat the bolus so it can prepare to move into the small intestine. Many of you may have had an experience where your cardioesophageal sphincter hasn't worked as well as you would have liked and this causes heartburn. Basically as acid fills the stomach to help break down food, if the cardioesophageal sphincter isn't completely shut then acid can move back up into the esophagus and this is what we commonly refer to as heartburn. On the other end, the pyloric sphincter has to work correctly and make sure food stays in the stomach long enough for it to go through its chemical digestion. So once the bolus has been covered with enough chemicals and broken down sufficiently, the pyloric sphincter will open and food will now move into the small intestine, which is starting right here with this term, the duodenum. Now at this point, we don't call it a bolus anymore. We call it chyme, and that's C-H-Y-M-E. The chyme is now going to move into the small intestine. Just a couple of side notes on the stomachs. You're not able to see all the intestines here in the abdomen. Now in this picture, of course, the skin and muscular layers have been removed. But the, remember the peritoneum, which is the membrane that covers the entire abdomen, it's been removed also. But you still see this yellow fatty substance. And it's actually connecting, this is the liver up here, and this is the stomach here, and it's covering all of the intestines. We call this substance the omentum. There is a lesser omentum, which attaches from an area of the stomach that we call the lesser curvature to the liver. And then there's the greater omentum, which attaches from the area of the stomach called the greater curvature to the side wall of the abdomen. So this would be the greater omentum coming off of the greater curvature of the stomach. And then the lesser omentum is hidden underneath the liver, but it attaches the lesser curvature to the liver. All right, once the chyme is ready to move into the small intestine, it's going to move through each of the three regions. And here is a picture of the intestines. And you'll notice there's this substance that's holding it together. This is called the mesentery. This is not the omentum. The omentum goes over the intestine. The mesentery holds the intestines together. And it's also where all the nerves and arteries and, um, and veins and things go to the intestine um, to keep them nourished and functioning. The three parts of the small intestine are first called the duodenum, then the jejunum, and then the ileum. So if you look back at our diagram, at this point we've come through the mouth to the oropharynx, and then below that the laryngeopharynx, the esophagus, and remember at this point the food that you've swallowed is called a bolus of food. It's going to enter the stomach at the cardioesophageal sphincter, and then the portions of the stomach are the cardiac, fundus, body, and pylorus, and the pyloric sphincter is going to keep food or the bolus of food inside the stomach until it's been digested enough with the stomach acids. At this point, we're going to call that chyme. Chyme is then going to move into the small intestine, and here's the first portion called the duodenum. And then it's going to move through this whole long tube of small intestine, through the second portion called the jejunum, and then it's going to keep moving through until it gets to the end, which is at your lower right quadrants, and that is called the ileum. At the end of the small intestine, there is another sphincter between the ileum and the first part of the large intestine. The first part of the large intestine is here in the lower right corner, and it's called the cecum. The end of the small intestine is called the ileum, and the valve that's between the two is called the ileocecal valve. Again, that is just basic med term, ileo for ileum and cecal for cecum valve. So it's the valve between the ileum and the cecum. On this view of the large intestine, the small intestine has been removed, which would be in the middle here, but you can see the ileocecal valve where the end of the 
the distal end of the ileum would come in, the beginning of the small intestine, which is the cecum. Now, I do want you to notice that the appendix hangs off the cecum, but we're not going to name that as part of the alimentary canal just because food is not supposed to go through it. In fact, it's when food and waste get trapped into the appendix that an infection of appendicitis can occur. So the food, which is now becoming waste, will move through the ileocecal valve into the cecum and then start moving up through the ascending colon and then go through this bend right here in the intestines, which we call the hepatic flexure. And if you're familiar with your med term, hepatico means liver, and the liver is right above this flexure. So the hepatic flexure, then it goes along the transverse colon to the next bend, which we call the splenic flexure, because the spleen is above on the left-hand side. Then it's going to go down the descending colon so it gets to the squiggly part here, which we call the sigmoid, and then it's going to go through the rectum, and then finally the anus. So basically, that's the parts of the alimentary canal. So what you'll want to do is work on your diagrams and work on this anatomy to make sure you understand the structures and how food is going to move through the alimentary canal. I count 21 steps, and I think if you get these steps down, you'll be very comfortable with understanding the anatomy and, and how it all connects in the digestive system. I'll go through them now for you. The mouth, it moves to the or, through the oropharynx, laryngeopharynx, esophagus, cardioesophageal sphincter, and into the stomach. Now, if you're listing stomach, you can name the parts also, the cardiac region, fundus, body, and pylorus. Then it moves through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum, through the jejunum, into the ileum, through the ileocecal valve, into the cecum, ascending colon, hepatic flexure, transverse colon, splenic flexure, descending colon, sigmoid, rectum, and anus, and then food is eliminated from the body.